All praise to the four-armed emperor for Ascension Day is at hand. Let's talk about Gene Steeler Colts for Warhammer 40k 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Gene Steelers and doing an overview of perhaps one of the most terrifying armies in Warhammer 40k at the moment, the endlessly respawning horde of mutant cultists sent to drag down your populations and prepare the way for their mysterious but I'm sure very benevolent gods. So far in 10th edition, Gene Steeler cults look like they're shaping up to be one of, if not the strongest faction in the game, perhaps only being rivaled by Eldari for that crown right now. Quite a lot of really quite strong units, but in particular backed up by a respawning horde of cultists that come back almost as quickly as you can cut them down. In the video we'll talk through their index, all of their powerful supporting rules, and then each data sheet in turn, and roughly where they rank up within the army. Index Gene Stealer Cults is a fairly typical one from 10th edition. They've got their army wide special rule, Cult Ambush, which is the one where you get two respawn squads once they're destroyed. Their detachment is the Ascension Day detachment with the They Came From Below special rule, giving them big advantages when they jump onto the board, either from reserves or from Cult Ambush. There's six stratagems, including some really quite powerful ones, four enhancements, 22 day sheets for the different units in the index, and also some Brew Brothers rules for allying in some Astra Militarum data sheets should they choose to. The points for all of these are found in the Munitorum field manual download. Jumping right in, let's start with the Cult Ambush special rule. This was redesigned from 9th edition pretty heavily. Previously, it's generally tended to be ways of dropping in close to the enemy and dealing some big damage when they do, with opponents not really knowing where the next strike is going to come from and hitting things that they can't really screen very well. It looks like those close deep strike mechanics and also their crossfire rules are both really kind of gone, at least on an army-wide scale. Plenty of their units do have deployment tricks, but the majority of the Cult Ambush rule is now a curious system of recycling units. If you get your unit destroyed, then you've got a chance to set it back up onto the board. Though when it returns to the board, you'll probably have to deploy it at least fairly far back within your own lines, unless you want your opponents to destroy the blip token and kill it dead for good. The way it works is that if you've got genes to the cult units with this rule, which most of them do, but generally not the characters or vehicles, then you roll a d6. On a 4+, plus, you get to essentially put that unit back into Cult Ambush Reserve and deploy a blip token on the board, which can be used to resurrect a unit. Usually it means that you've basically got a coin flip chance of redeploying a key unit, though if you've got battle line units on the go, then they essentially get to have it happen automatically. These Cult Ambush essentially redeployed beacons have to be deployed somewhere greater than 9 inches away from the enemy models, though in reality you're often going to want to deploy further than that away. The reason is that you only actually get your unit redeployed during the next enemy reinforcement phase, not your own. So it means that, say, if an opponent shoots an enemy unit to death, they've got the rest of their turn to play. Then you'll have your turn where your unit won't come back. And then you've got the enemy turn when they've got an extra movement phase, so they can move close to the blip and essentially try and remove it before your unit pops up again. To remove a cold ambush token, all the enemy needs to do is move a unit within 9 inches of it. So if they've got anything with fast movement or some deep strike, they could potentially be removing it straight off the board again. So placing these blip tokens is kind of like a bit of a mini game, potentially having to deploy them far enough back that your opponent can't get their hands on them too easily, but also not so far back that the unit's going to be completely out of the game and kind of irrelevant so the opponent can just safely ignore them. For other technicalities, characters that are attached to a unit can't come back when they're redeployed, so say if you had a Primus leading a bunch of Neophytes, just the Neophytes would come back and not the Primus. All the models come back at full wounds remaining, though I have seen some debate as to whether or not they come back with one use things restored like demo charges. My reading of the rule would be that they probably don't get them back when they get to redeploy, as unlike say the Astra Militarum reinforcement stratagem, you don't place an identical unit into strategic reserve, it's literally that unit that gets recycled. So my reading would be that they don't get the demo charges back for the second time round, I'd guess that Games Workshop will probably FAQ to confirm that. I'd also bear in mind that no one blip token is ties to any one unit, so say if you had lots of units in Cold Ambush, you could choose which one you wanted to appear at each blip, and then from there to redeploy a unit, you put one model touching the Cold Ambush token, and the rest of the models in the unit deploy via Deep Strike, so deploying somewhere outside of 9 inches of enemy models, but at least at time of recording it does mean that you can chain them out really quite a long distance from that marker, particularly if you've got a really big block like Neophytes. As 10th edition rules go, I'd say it's a little bit more of a complicated than most other factions rules, but it is absolutely enormously powerful, potentially having units that your opponent might kill 2 or 3 times over the course of a game is quite a big deal. 
Fighting a theoretically never-ending horde can certainly be pretty spooky. I might give your opponent pause as to whether or not they actually want to fully wipe units, just in case they come back, just in case they come back just as strong in a turn or two. As mentioned, it can create a bit of a movement mini-game. You need to deploy them far enough away to stay safe from enemies to stop them wiping them out, but you also need them to be close enough to return to the fight effectively. And occasionally that could be a valid tactic in its own right, giving your opponent hard choices as to whether or not they move a powerful unit into a distant corner of the board to scrub a blip token, and that might take them out of the fight for a turn. Overall though, I think it's a very powerful rule indeed, and a couple of things can interact with it a little bit, say for example the Nexos manipulating blips and moving them around a little to either keep them safe or get them closer, and the Acolyte Icon Ward has the potential to save one of them once per game, redeploying it when the opponent moves to wipe it out. Overall, I do really like the rule. It does make them function as a very different army to many other factions in 40k, though it does seem it might be a little bit on the overtuned side. At the moment, I think it's a big reason why Gene Stiller Colts are as powerful as they are. Though I do think it's the sort of thing that you can just address with points. If you pay a bigger premium for the units that are going to respawn multiple times, then they're kind of worth it for the ability. I think I would prefer them to fix it that way as opposed to actually mess with the rule, which does seem quite characterful and flavourful in its own right. For the Gene Stealer Cult launch detachment, they get the Ascension Day detachment. Compared with the old rules, I'd say it maybe feels a little bit similar to the Cult of the Four-Armed Emperor, perhaps. Over the last few codexes, they've tended to have bonuses out of reserves. The detachment rule is a fairly simple one. They came from below. Each time a Gene Stealer Cult unit in your army is set up on the battlefield as reinforcement, until the end of the next fight phase, your weapons get sustained hits worn and ignores cover. This one lasts until the end of your next fight phase, so it is relevant for things that say deployed via the cold ambush rule, they would come down in your opponent's turn, so even though they're not acting on that exact turn, it still lasts until yours, so they would get big damage output boosts there, and the same for rapid ingress as well, as well as things just traditionally deep striking. It's really quite a powerful damage boost, ignoring cover is really nice in 10th edition where almost everything seems to get cover saves these days. Definitely a big boost to near fight shooting blocks and potentially acolytes throwing around demo charges. The sustained hits one is also really, really big. A fair few things in Gene Stealer Colts hit on a 5 plus, things like the mining weapons when they're moving or the demo charges. If those weapons are hitting on a 5, then it means that this is effectively a plus 50% damage increase, which is pretty massive. In general, I'd say it's easier to use with shooting than it is with melee perhaps, just not quite as easy to guarantee charges out of deep strike now without using rapid ingress. And I feel like it's a rule that really synergizes with what the army wanted to do anyway, making heavy use of units popping up with Colt Ambush or out of reserve. I'd say the stratagems within the detachment are mostly fairly standout as well. Going through them quickly, for one CP there's Unquestioning Loyalty, this one's one for protecting characters, which is maybe a little bit more niche. You pick a character and you can basically shrug failed saves on that character for mortal wounds on a nearby unit. And I guess that's nice enough in itself, as it means that you get to take invulnerable saves if your character had any, before taking the mortal wounds on the other squad. It could be quite nice to basically guarantee a character survives against some precision shots, though you do need to declare it when the targets are actually chosen, as opposed to after any rolls have been done and your character fails saves, so you do need to preempt things a bit. Could be useful on occasion to save a key character that would otherwise be out in the open as well. Maybe something like a Reductor Saboteur or a Patriarch that's taken a bunch of fire, but happens to be nearby, say a big block of friendly neophytes or something similar to tank damage. A pricey one for two command points is a coordinated trap, a plus one to wound for two units targeting one enemy unit used in either the shooting or the fight phase. I think against the right target this could be decent enough. I feel like it's only usually going to be worth it if you've got two really quite threatening units both hitting an enemy unit hard, and the plus one to wound is going to be relevant on both of them. I could see it being pretty good, for example, say if you had some acolytes arriving next to the enemy units to drop off some demo charges, plus maybe also some neophyte blocks with seismic cannons, with their mid-strength shots being really quite handy for the plus one to wound. Talking of acolytes turning up nearby, for one command point, there's tunnel crawlers. This one's the nice one to arrive just outside of three inches of enemy models, but you can't charge when you've done so, though you can shoot. Close deep strike means that you can have all sorts of applications in 40k. Perhaps the most obvious one is acolytes with a bunch of demolition charges just turning up right next to the enemy and then just throwing a whole load of strength 12 bombs all over them. It can just be nice to defeat enemy screening and get in range of something key in any case though. And it's also really big for the mission, things like dropping units to deploy teleport homers or get in the enemy backfield. 
or even if your opponent is just standing a little bit off an objective, you might well be able to swipe a primary objective of them, which could be absolutely game-changing, as well as getting you some close-range damage on the unit that was holding it. A really nice stratagem, this one. Absolutely certainly one that will be tempted to build around, or have opportunistic units in reserve to use it with. For 1 CP, there's a perfect ambush. This one's a very nice damage boost, with plus 1 ballistic skill and an extra AP-1 from a unit coming from reserves. For one command point, I think this is pretty excellent value. It's usually going to be better than the plus one to wounds due to it being a bit more flexible and both giving you extra ballistic skill and extra AP. It's very good with big 20-man blocks of neophytes and also big blocks of acolytes with the demo charges once more. Maybe could be a nice one to get for free with a Nexos, perhaps. Next for one command point, there's one with a darkness. One infantry unit can't be shot at greater than 12 inches range, kind of giving them a bit like lone operative, and they also get stealth as well, just to keep them a bit safe against enemies shooting nearby them. You get to declare this one after your opponent's selected targets for shooting, so it does mean that you don't have to actually declare it until you know that they're actually going to try and target your squad. And again, this one's a pretty fantastic one, I think. Keeping a unit 100% guaranteed safe from shooting is absolutely massive, whether it's a fragile unit standing on a primary objective perhaps, or whether it's a whole bunch of really scary damage dealers just turned up from Colt Ambush that the opponent can't shoot, and then in your own turn can go forward to move, shoot, and potentially charge the enemy, guaranteeing you the alpha strike on them. Again, absolutely enormously powerful stuff there. Finally, for one command point, we've got Return to the Shadows. This one's one where your units go back into reserve at the end of your opponent's turn, provided they're not in engagement range of enemy units when targeted. You get to take up to two Gene Stealer Cult units off the battlefield and put them into Strategic Reserve. With the Strategic Reserve clarifications, it does mean that they can come down as with Deep Strike as before. It does seem like quite a nice one to use perhaps in the later stages of the game, where it's perhaps more important to get a bunch of units right into the enemy's face and taking down objectives. Again, this could be an interesting one to use with Colt Ambush. You could have them respawn somewhere safe. And then if you've got two battle line units, they could go back into reserves at the end of the opponent's turn. So it means that you could guarantee those Colt Ambush units get right on the front lines, just outside of 9 inches of the enemy's army. Overall, I must admit that the Gene Stealer Colt stratagems really are standout, and you're kind of spoilt for choice with how we can spend your limited pool of command points. I'd say the character protection one is merely okay and situational. The plus one to wound could be worth it against a really big target. I guess sometimes it might be necessary. But the other four ones I think are all absolutely amazing. Close deep strike, big extra shooting damage, guaranteed unit protection from shooting, and return to the shadows to redeploy and keep up the pressure. All of these are absolutely standouts, and I could see any of those being used more than once per game. Finally for the detachment, we get on to the enhancements. First up for 15 points, there's Prowling Adjutant. This one's a reactive move of d6 inches if the enemy finishes a move within 9 inches. I say that this one's a nice to have on a threatening unit that you're expecting to put in the midboard. Sometimes it's not really going to be a big deal and won't make a huge difference to your unit, but say if that d6 inches allows you to backpedal and avoid a charge, or maybe even hide behind terrain and avoid enemy fire, both of those could be pretty helpful. I guess it could also be nice enough if you want to make a lone operative really, really disruptive, maybe put it on a reductor saboteur and then the opponent's really going to struggle to get within 12 inch to shoot you, if when the enemy gets close the saboteur just moves further away. Inscrutable Cunning is a really quite powerful one, 30 points to give one Gene Stealer Cult unit the Infiltrator's ability, really quite a nice one for putting a big threat unit in the midfield somewhere, usually that would be normally something that you'd just need to use Gene Stealers for. Perhaps the one that I've seen talked about the most with this are having Aberrants do a first turn charge potentially, or at least to get them further up the board even if you put them out of line of sight. With a big toughness 6 and the 4 plus feel no pains, they've got enough durability to weather a lot of enemy damage, and they perhaps seem a unit that's high investment enough to justify the 30 points for this. Plus on top of that you also get a chance to farm a command point on a 4 plus. You could have a go at defending them with at 1 with the darkness and have a good chance of recouping the CP. Next up, for 40 points, we've got Meticulous Planner. This one's an opponent's stratagem debuff one, making one stratagem cost one command point more for the opponent for the rest of the game after they've used it once. Against some armies, it could be absolutely game-changing and well worth the pricey investment of 40 points, though against some armies, they're just not really going to care all that much, and at the end of the day, even if they just ignore one stratagem, they will spend the command point somewhere else that's useful for them. You could do really disruptive things like use it on Overwatch for armies that rely on it, or use it on the command point reroll, or something else that's key for the army. But in general at 40 points, I'd say it's decently usable but not auto-include. Finally for 10 points, there's Focus of Adoration. This one's a 0 CP heroic intervention to allow your units to support other nearby units. 
Maybe it does seem a little bit on the situational side though, given that you need to be within 6 inches of an enemy unit that's charged one of your friends. It is very cheap at just 10 points, and if you had a big threatening melee unit that's going to be in the centre of the board, could be alright. I think if you were going for an enhancement on some dangerous aberrants or something though, you might just be better off with the inscrutable cunning one. Overall, out of these, I'd say that Inscrutable Cunning is probably the best between the command points and the infiltrate. Prowling Adjutant seems handy enough. Maybe the other two seem a little bit more borderline. Overall, though, I think Gene Silla Colts have done very, very well with their launch detachment. The stratagems are absolutely amazing, and there's loads of tempting ones that you could easily burn a lot of your CP into. And the detachment rule seems to work really quite nicely with what Gene Silla Colts want to do anyway, jumping down and dealing some mass damage out of reserve. Otherwise, before the data sheets, the other major rule in the Gene Stealer Colts Index is the Brood Brothers Detachment Rule. This is the one where the Gene Stealer Colts basically gets to steal a bunch of Astra Militarum data sheets if they'd like to, but only ones from a set list. You can take a number of data sheets from them, going up to a quarter of your points limit, so 250 for an incursion, 500 for strike force, or 750 for onslaught. And if there's any one data sheet that you think is just very strong and could help out your game plan, it does mean that you can just basically cherry pick a little bit of guard technology to help out with the Gene Stealer Cult Uprising. As with most allies in the game, there will be some disadvantages. The guard units will lose some powerful options for their army. You won't get the detachment rule, which is born soldiers, so no lethal hits when you stand still. That is kind of relevant for artillery, which get a bit of their damage output from that. You won't be able to access any orders at all, as the voice of command keyword only functions if you've got your entire army as the Astra Militarum faction. And you won't have access to any guard stratagems, notably the reinforcements one, which is kind of relevant for guard in general for their own version of recycling units. So that can make certain units like infantry squads and sentinels not quite as good at respawning, not compared with your own cultists. At time of recording at least, the Gene Stealer Cult faction is significantly more powerful than the Imperial Guard. Their tournament win rates are in the mid-60s as opposed to in the lower 40s like the Guard. Really quite a massive disparity. And at least the majority of lists that I've seen don't generally tend to be using Astra Militarum datasheets. Just for some of the more generally considered to be strong Guard units, could consider things like Death Corps, Krieg, Infantry, plus a Field Marshal and Psyker. You wouldn't get the orders or anything. They would have a block that's generally a bit more tanky than neophytes to hold the mid-board early. They do have the fairly major disadvantage of not being able to respawn, and don't get those nice seismic cannons either. Artillery does lack lethal hits outside of the Imperial Guard's main detachment, but a few of the Guard's choices are really quite efficient, and could be kind of handy just to whittle down a couple of depleted enemy units. In particular, I feel like a Basilisk or an Earthshaker platform could be useful enough, as well as just the raw damage output, you could have the option to slow enemy units, and that could be pretty relevant with stopping them reaching your blip tokens. Scout or Armoured Sentinels could give you some really quite tough vehicle wounds in the mid-board if you'd like. The Scout ones could give you some pretty tanky things to move forward and keep back the enemy as well. Again, maybe helping out with blips. Not being able to respawn or order them though is a bit of a disadvantage once more. And for battle tanks, perhaps some of the better ones could be the Lehman Ross Demolisher or the Rogal Dawn battle tank. Both at least reasonably powerful data sheets and do offer some slightly longer ranged anti-tank damage that the Gene Stealer Cult might be wanting. But in general, within the whole context of 40k, they aren't usually seen to be the absolute apex of tanks. The guard tanks are generally just a little bit overcosted from where they need to be, I think. I feel like in particular the better choices could be Basilisks, Earthshakers, or maybe some Scout Sentinels. I think they'd be unlikely to detract much from a Gene Stealer Cult army, at least if used optimally. But I can see why a lot of people are just choosing to leave any guard at home. Brood Brothers aside though, let's talk through the Gene Stealer Cult datasheets. A few infantry, some bikes, a couple of vehicles, and then an enormous amount of character support. Battle line units are kind of important to the index, given that they respawn automatically with the cult ambush. And as you'd expect, neophytes and acolyte hybrids are both battle line. There's going to be lots of those in most lists, I think. Data sheets wise, nothing major has changed. No loss or gain since the previous codex. There's a tectonic frag drill that had rules in its previous codex. That's now acquired some rules for legends and has some interesting things around recycling cult ambush tokens that get scrubbed out by the enemy. Genuinely could have been worth consideration if it wasn't Legends, though seeing as it's going to be left out of balance passes for the Index, it's maybe a bit questionable to use in any sort of power gaming -y type way. For just a few common trends on the datasheets themselves, there's Deep Strike on the vast majority of units. Most of the infantry can get it innately, so kind of similar to previous Colt Ambush, except no setting up closer. I think it's mainly just the bikes and vehicles that don't have it. Most units in the army have Leadership 7. Some of the higher tier characters and the Clamorvus have Leadership 6 to give them a little bit more defence against Battleshock if relevant. 
The data sheets that they do have are fairly heavy for things like infiltrate, scout and lone operatives, maybe not too surprising given that their games workshops are guerrilla warfare style army. And one other helpful thing is that there aren't really any major restrictions on fielding multiple characters, say multiple primuses within the same army as there might have been in the past. Previously it was a gene stealer cult thing, so you could only have say one character of each sort per detachment. Now though you could have say multiple primuses or multiple reductor saboteurs, though some of them still have rules that you can only apply once per army overall. Let's jump into the data sheets then, and we'll start out with the battle line units, and then talk about the other squads and bikes. First up, and perhaps arguably one of the single strongest and most important data sheets in the entire index at the moment, are the neophyte hybrids. Garzman equivalent models with toughness 3 and a 5 plus save, objective control 2, and they cost 80 points per unit of 10, or 160 per unit of 20. Fairly expensive in terms of toughness for the cost, but they do come with an enormous amount of gear for free now. You get two special weapons and two heavy weapons per unit of 10 of them. Often I think I'd generally be most tempted by the grenade launchers with their strength 9 and damage D3 shots for a bit more punch. And then for the heavy weapons, I think the debate is between mining lasers and seismic cannons for me. The heavy stowers just seem to be flat inferior to the seismic cannons. Seismic cannons have four shots hitting on a 5 plus with strength 6, AP 1 and damage D3. They've got the heavy keywords hit on 4s if they're static and rapid fire 2 if they're within 12 inch range, so you will get 6 shots out of them there. They seem to be the most common profile that people are building around with multiple stacking buffs on them. Though I still think that mining lasers aren't awful, with essentially a last cannon shot at 24 inches, but obviously not quite as general purpose. Otherwise the rest of the neophytes get hybrid firearms, essentially a last gun profile at strength 3, AP 0 and damage 1. No option for shotguns anymore sadly, they're just consolidated into the units. And the neophyte leader can get a power weapon and has a bolt pistol style profile if you'd like. Neophytes are pretty amazing just for their raw damage and defence, with 20 model units being really quite common, led by powerful characters, and then using some combination of the big stacked shooting benefits, things like Ridge Runners, Primus as leading them to re-roll hits, plus the Colt Ambush damage boost, and maybe one or two of the stratagems as well. I think that alone, plus being able to redeploy with Colt Ambush automatically pretty much, makes them a really interesting unit for the army full stop. But they also have some other advantages, farming command points with their planned generations in the making special rule. If they are an objective on the command phase, then they get to roll a 4 plus to gain a CP. Really quite big considering how good the Gene Stealer Colt stratagems are. And their cult icon allows you to respawn 3 destroyed models in the movement phase, or D3 plus 3 models if they happen to be on an objective that you control. That in itself is really quite huge, and it means that the opponent can't really win whether they wipe them out or not. If they don't wipe them out, then models respawn. If they do wipe them out, then they're probably redeploying by cult ambush in a turn or so. Overall an absolutely excellent unit, lots of lists seem to be building around multiple big blocks of 20, I think that smaller units are also viable, maybe just for rustling up CP on home objectives. Also incredibly scary are the Acolyte Hybrids, 5-10 to 10 models for 75 points or 150. These guys really aren't particularly tough for the cost, just one wound at toughness 4 and a 5 plus save. They're definitely a unit that's all about damage and not much about defence. For the base stat lines, they hit with a flurry of attacks at strength 4, AP 1 and damage 1. Okay enough for mauling light infantry, and they can take some heavy mining tools with one consolidated profile now, two attacks at strength 10, AP 2 and damage 3, quite good against medium vehicles, or still struggle against toughness 12 things. I certainly say the scariest thing about the acolytes though are the mass demolition charges they can take, they can take 2 per 5 of them, so you can have 4 being thrown out by a 10 man unit, and these are a really interesting weapon, Hitting on a 5 plus at only 6 inch range, but a huge D6 plus 3 attacks at strength 12, AP 2 and damage 2. They're only one shot and they're hazardous so they give you a chance to kill the model that's using them. But they do have the blast keyword which helps them out against bigger units of elite infantry. And assault if you wanted to try and get them close by jumping them out of say a goliath or something. In reality though I think that the best way to deploy them is dropping them in via that 3 inch deep strike stratagem. Get 4 demo charges on the target get the sustained hits worn and ignores cover, and they also have their own built-in damage boost as well, re-rolling hit rolls of 1 innately, and re-rolling wound rolls of 1 as well if the opponent's on an objective. Again, with their powerful shooting, they're a unit that can be buffed by all sorts of things, like the stratagem that we talked about with the plus 1 to hit and the extra AP, or other things like the Achilles Ridge Runners or maybe attached characters. They also get hand flamers as well, plus the cult icon for respawning either D3 or 3 models, so a few less than the neophytes but still meaningful if you don't wipe them out. And again they seem like a very strong unit for the codex, perhaps one of the best tools to deal with the toughest things in the enemy army, with mass demolition charges blowing things sky high. 
Next up, we've got hybrid metamorphs, which I think are a bit more overshadowed compared with the first two. They're not battle lines, so get much more shaky respawns than the battle line squads do. And they also cost a little bit more than the acolyte hybrids, despite lacking things like demo charges and the heavy mining weapons. Their melee is definitely a bit more threatening than the acolytes, though. Their metamorph mutations hit at strength 5, AP minus 1, or damage 2, so big increases there, and they can have a sweep mode for dealing with hordes more efficiently. Plus, they've got a rather nice fights on death rule for a 3, plus, which is pretty helpful against enemy melee armies if they have got something that might well kill these but get cut down in return. They also get scouts as well if you want to deploy them on the board. They could be setting up a little bit further into the midfield than most of your other units. Delivering them to charge via deep strike isn't something that's anywhere near as easy to do as it was before though. At the moment I wouldn't say they're terrible, but I think they're going to get overshadowed by the battle line units for the most part. Perhaps a unit that might be a little bit more taken if the battle line units weren't quite so dominant, though they do have the weakness of not punching up quite so well against heavy vehicles and things, which both the Neophytes and Acolytes might be able to do a little bit better than them, making them a bit more well-rounded maybe. Aberrants on the other hand are a unit that seems to be looking very very strong, 5 to 10 models for either 165 points or 330 for 10 of them. Big tanky Gene Steeler Cult units that can both give and receive big punctures. Their durability is fairly monstrous these days. Toughness 6, so a lot of small arms won't be very effective against them. A 5 plus save and 3 wounds, and a feel no pain of 4 plus, meaning that they have a pretty reasonable chance to shrug off even powerful anti tank firepower if they roll well. As if that weren't all enough, if you've got a character in the unit, which you pretty much should have, they also get a minus 1 to wound against anything that's either strength 7 or higher and beating their toughness, so usually a lot of things are going to be wounding them on a 4 plus or a 3 plus at best. Their durability really does seem very good for essentially 33 points per model, and definitely a unit that you can afford to have on the front line. In combat, their heavy power weapons are pretty general purpose. Three attacks at strength 8, AP 2 and damage 3. Again, I do think that that's pretty solid for just 33 points per model. Still going to be wounding vehicles on a 5+, plus, but if you do get any wounds through, they are at damage 3, and that will eat away when you've got a whole squad of these fighting. They can get some pretty significant buffs from characters as well. I have seen some people choosing to use that infiltration war war trait and start them up the board. Could be massively threatening and problematic for your opponent's army to kill, or maybe a unit that's big and dangerous enough to deliver via rapid ingress, put them down somewhere where they're not going to get wiped out, and then move forward and charge and hit things very hard in your turn. Nice to see these guys a lot more usable again, they certainly felt a lot more mid in 9th edition. Next up we've got the Pure Strain Gene Stealers, 5-10 to 10 models for 90 points or 180. Now with their 2 wound profile and the 5 plus invulnerable save, maybe a little bit of a side grade on the durability there. The Gene Stealers are the unit in the index that get infiltrate, so they could set up on mid-board objectives and easily threaten first turn charges. They've got a very long charge threat range with 8 inches plus advance and charge as well. On average, they could be charging units around about 20 inches away, so it means that they could easily afford to set up somewhere that's safe behind a ruin or something, and then make the long charge after that. When they get there, they're certainly a lot more anti-infantry than anti-tank. Four attacks at strength 4, AP 2, and damage 1, that you could give them a patriarch to make them a lot more general purpose. Overall, I think they're solid enough for the cost for their abilities that they get, though at the moment not a whole load of people are running them in competitive lists, I don't think it's actually because they're a bad unit whatsoever. Reliable, very long first turn charges are nice to have and can be worth a premium, but it's just perhaps competition from just how outstanding a whole bunch of the other units are, and alongside that enhancement, they will be competing against aberrants deploying in the midfield, and they're so much tougher and a lot more general purpose damage. Next up, we've got the Atalan Jackals, either 5 models or 10, and you have to take the Wolf Quads now, 80 points for 5, or 160 for 10 of them. For the cost, I'd say the defensive profile is okay, but not particularly exciting. Toughness 4 with a 5 plus save, the Jackals have 2 wounds and the Wolf Quad has 4. It's not absolutely awful for the cost, though not standout either. In general though, being mountain models, I feel like there's a reasonable chance of these guys taking a turn of fire before they're getting close to deal their damage, and that does make them a little bit harder to use than they might look on paper. They do have scouts 9 inches, so you could potentially redeploy the squad a little bit to try and keep them safe from the opponent. Or if you've got first turn, move straight up into the midfield, maybe think about doing a bit of alpha striking on anything that's set up fairly far forward. They can call to ambush as well, but they come back on a 4+, plus as they're not battle line, and when they're set back up, they need to be within 6 inches of a battlefield edge, as they don't get deep strike. Weapons-wise, they've got some okay mixed anti-infantry shooting and combat. Their small arms get them two shots at strength 4 within 12 inches, and then they could charge in with their power weapons, which they get for free, two attacks at strength 4, AP 2, 
Kind of nice for bullying thing is like toughness 3 on 4 infantry with worse saves. Horn gets a grenade launcher for a little bit more long range threat. And the wolf quad I think I'd be most tempted by the mining laser for a strength 12 last cannon shot at 24 inches. The thing that scares most people about these guys though is their demolition run special rule. Representing them dropping off some explosives. If they finish a normal move within 6 inches of the enemy. So move 12 inches and finish within 6. Theoretically an 18 inch threat range. You get to roll 1d6 for each jackal in the squad. On a 4 plus the enemy takes a mortal wound. So on a big 10 man squad that'd be 5 mortal wounds. And you can also take a jackal alphas in the squad to allow them an additional move. And that could allow you to do the mortal wound thing all over again. Theoretically that would be 11 mortal wounds out of the unit each turn they get to do that. Which is kind of ruinous to a lot of enemy units up close. Never mind any actual damage that the squad does with their guns or combat. Though they are a squad that does have some limitations. You probably struggle to hide a massive 10 man unit like that. As they've got a fairly bulky footprint. And they have to go around terrain which might stop them getting within that 6 inch kill range. Still though I definitely think that they're usable enough. Massively scary mortal wound output on a bunch of fast bodies that could be used for disruption or move blocking. I still have a pretty terrifying potential to respawn big if they are killed early. Vehicle units next and first up we've got the Achilles Ridge Runner. Can be taken in one or two model squads for either 75 points or 150. Like the bikes they can also scout move up should they want to. And for the cost they've got a sort of middling toughness vehicle. Toughness 7, 8 wounds and a 3 plus save. Maybe not enormously hard to kill. These things can either take the Achilles missile launcher, the heavy mortar or the heavy mining laser with D3 shots that are last cannon profile. For raw damage if you did want to go for direct fire then perhaps the heavy mining laser seems the best to me there. Quite nice to have the blast rule for extra shots against hordes and things. Otherwise I guess potentially the heavy mortar could probably be the most interesting to the list for perhaps just a hidden ridge runner in your own deployment zone somewhere. That could allow you to hit most enemy units on the map and put out the extra AP debuff exactly where you need it. Speaking of which, the Achilles Ridge Runner has really quite a powerful debuff, making one enemy unit that's hit by a Ridge Runner an extra AP minus one for all of your shooting targeting that. So again, that could be another way to get seismic cannons with extra AP or demo charges AP3, potentially AP4 with the stratagem as well. Again, that's really quite a big deal with their combined fire synergy that they can have. You just do need to make sure that you actually get the hit on the target. It does have a twin heavy stubber that can also trigger it as well. But the heavy mortar might be just a little bit unreliable if it is firing out of line of sight and hitting on fives. Then it can back up its main weapons with one of three war gear abilities. The flare launcher for the smoke keyword seems a little bit weak. Otherwise you can have a spotter to get a ballistic skill 3 plus. Which I guess could be useful for handing out the hits with the heavy mortar. Or you could double down with the survey auger and allow any unit that's hit to have the ignores cover ability against it. I guess that won't be relevant for anything setting up out of cold ambush or out of deep strike as you'd have that anyway. But seems pretty handy for any units that have managed to remain on the board. I think that both of those two seems like a pretty reasonable option. You could even maybe have multiple ridge runners, one with each perhaps. Overall it seems very very strong while some of the best damage dealers in the index are either neophytes with a bunch of shooting or acolytes with a bunch of demo charges. Very reasonable to have one or two in the list and they can chip away with their own little bit of firepower as well. Next up we've got the Goliath vehicles, the truck's 110 points and has a transport capacity of 12. Most infantry units are allowed to get in but no patriarchs are allowed to ride. For the cost I'd say it's got kind of middling toughness, toughness 9, a 3 plus save and 10 wounds, kind of similar to a space marine rhino but costing really quite a lot more. In addition to just its transport duties it does come with a few weapons built into it, a twin auto cannon which gets to re-roll wound rolls. Could be good for a wound or two, though AP1's a little unreliable. And perhaps more threateningly, a demolition charge cash if you manage to get close. Essentially the same profile that you get on the Acolytes, hitting on 5+, plus with a strength 12, AP2 and damage 2 goodness. The Goliath truck gets one of those rules where if you target one enemy unit with this, then it gets to buff the damage output of a unit that just got out of it. Meaning that you would get to re-roll wound rolls with things like Neophyte Seismic Cannons or Acolyte Demo Charges after they've just jumped out. Again that's another very powerful layered shooting buff that you can have with this. Overall I'd say that 110 points it seems usable. I don't think that Mass Goliaths are probably going to be a good idea. But with a unit of Neophytes or Acolytes delivering some decent enough shooting onto midfield objectives and snatching them off the foe seems usable to me. I still think that the mainstay of the army at this stage is probably going to be battle line units not in transports though. Otherwise we've got the Goliath Rock Grinder, 155 points, but unfortunately not really all that much more durable than the Goliath truck. It only gains one pip of toughness but has the same defence otherwise, and I do think that that's a little bit on the fragile side for a vehicle of this cost. This one transports 6 models but gets a lot more threat, 
Probably a mining laser or clearance incinerator look like the best choices for the primary weapon. Either some okay anti-tank or some nice threatening attacks for overwatch on midfield objectives maybe. Otherwise it does also get the demolition charges if you get close. And it's got its drill dozer blade which gives you a bunch of strength 10, AP2 and damage 2 attacks in melee. Plus if you make a charge you get grinding clearance. An average of 3 mortal wounds on the charge there. And he could even double down with tank shock with this thing. Usually that would average around about 7 mortal wounds worth of impact hits before you even get to the strength 10 attacks. I certainly think that overall between its shooting, demo charges, transport capacity and some fairly scary melee threat, it is at least a fairly terrifying vehicle if the opponent gets too close to it. I think perhaps the biggest issue with that though is that it's really not that hard to kill for virtually anything that's good at killing tanks. I guess maybe you could strategic reserve it and have it come in from rapid ingress, but in Genes to the Colts you've just got so many options to do that sort of thing with, plus command points are a little bit on the stretch side anyway. Maybe you could use one or so as a counter-attack unit if the enemy does push up too far. Next up we get onto the Gene Steeler Colt's big cast of characters. We'll start with perhaps the traditional inner circle of the Colt with the Patriarch and his Brew Coven and things with the Leadership 6 and then move on to the more elite support characters. First up for 85 points we've got the Patriarch, a fairly similar stat line to what he had in 9th edition. Reasonably tanky as characters go with toughness 5, 6 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save. Plus I suppose he could try and save him with that stratagem to bounce wounds onto nearby units if there's one convenience. It's got to be a warlord if he's part of the army. And typically he'd be wanting to lead pure strain gene stealers and can infiltrate ahead with them if desired. Having his own melee in the unit makes the squad a lot more general purpose and not just good at killing light infantry. He's got 5 attacks at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2, devastating wounds and twin linked. He should be able to reliably take a chunk out of just about whatever he charges into. On top of that he also gives devastating wounds to the pure strain unit so their attacks will be a bit more general purpose than they would have been before. Cosmic Horror for a battle shock test on enemy units within 6 inches in the fight phase might stop them interrupting if you get lucky. And once per game he can extend that even further with his familiar. Battle shock in the fight phase though I think is maybe a little bit on the niche side. Overall despite not really offering too much outside of his melee brawling profile I think he's not too bad for 85 points. Again, I think he's one of the units in the Gene Stealer Colts that will be run at least fairly regularly if some of their other options were just a little bit less overtuned. If Games Workshop does decide to bump up the points costs of just some basic neophytes and acolytes at some stage, which they might, I feel like we'd see more Patriarchs and Gene Stealers in play. I think his numbers are strong enough when you're basically guaranteeing a first turn charge with him, set him up with a Gene Stealer somewhere in the midfield, and then with their advance and charge they get an absolutely enormously long threat range. Next up for the Colt in a circle, we've got the Primus. 70 points and can lead either Acolyte Hybrids, Hybrid Metamorphs or Neophyte Hybrids. Most of the more standard issue Colt characters perhaps don't have enormous profiles to write home too much about, but he can chip in with a bit of anti-infantry melee. A flurry of attacks from his Bone Sword with damage 1 and AP 2, and a couple of Toxin Injector Claws that have extra attacks and anti-infantry 2 plus. Regardless of his combat profile though, he gets two really quite nice rules. First up, Colt Demagogue to allow you to re-roll the hit roll when he's leading a unit. Absolutely massive with both Neophytes and Acolytes, particularly when some of their scarier weapons hit on a 5 plus innately, maybe a 4 plus with a stratagem. Re-rolling everything and getting lots of 5s and 6s and sustained hits on 6s seems like a great use for me. Then he also gives you a first turn redeploy as well, which means that you can put units into strategic reserve as well if it would make sense. You would have to do this before you know who gets first turn, but still, if you can just do a little bit of wiggling of your units to make sure that it's less punishing if your opponent goes first, then perhaps all the better. Overall, a very strong character, seeming to be very popular leading neophytes in particular, though a fine leading acolytes as well if you need some absolutely devastating demo charge bombs. The Magus is 50 points, though unlike the Primus, is perhaps struggling to be a credible choice for the Gene Stealer Colts, and I think it's rarely going to get taken when in competition with the other good characters that the Colt has to offer. They don't have any psychic shooting attacks now and get a major stave when they're in combat, a small amount of extra slightly more quality melee attacks, strength 5, AP 1 and damage D3. The Magus gives you three things really, leadership 6 plus like the Primus does, a spiritual leader special rule giving you a 5 plus feel no pain against psychic attacks, handy in some matchups, completely useless in many, and then a minus 1 to hit power in the shooting phase that usually is only 12 inches away, though can be extended to 24 inches once per game with the familiar. Usually it will hand out a minus 1 to hit for an enemy unit shooting, though if you do look out and roll a 6, you might prevent the enemy unit from shooting at all. I think this is just a bit unreliable really. The enemy might well not have a unit that's within 12 inches that's worth putting the debuff on, and the psychic defence is super situational, and she doesn't really offer a fat lot else. I guess they're still quite cheap at least, if you do have the model and want to field one. 
Next up, the Acolyte Icon Ward is the Colt Banner Bearer. 50 points for another cheap support character. Not really much melee or range damage to speak of. All about the leadership. He just grants a 5 plus feel no pain type save to the Colt unit in general. That does make them a decent amount tougher. Seems probably best for something like a Neophyte block in the mid board. The sort of unit that you usually want your opponents to have to put additional damage into. If they survive, they might well just respawn a bunch of models with their cult icons and retain an objective for you. Maybe doubles down on the no sit win situation. If you kill the squad, then you might take the objective for a bit, but they'll be back even if it is without the acolyte icon ward. Otherwise though, his summon the cult special rule is quite a good one as well. Once per game, when you have to remove a cult ambush marker because your opponent has moved too close to it, if the icon ward is still alive, then you get to redeploy that cult icon marker anywhere that's within 12 inches of a model from your army, and somewhere that's not within 9 inches horizontally of any enemy units. That one is perhaps a deceptively powerful ability. If that does happen and your opponent wipes out a blip, that's usually going to be the choice between a unit respawning or not doing so. So if that move ever does go off meaningfully, it means that your 50 point character could be saving a unit that's actually far more valuable than itself. I think between the two abilities, he probably does enough to justify his place in the army, Though I guess with a blip deployment, you might just want to be putting them in places where your opponent can't reach them anyway. I suppose this could save you if you've just got something that they can't be screened from, or if they find some other way of rustling up some extra movement, say with a long charge. I think between his two abilities, he definitely could be worth it. I feel like they maybe conflict a little bit though. He wants to stay safe to use some of the cult, but he also wants to be on the front line to make his durability buff felt. Unlike a few of the others, he can't join a unit that's already got a character attached to it as well. So sadly you can't double up on him plus a Primus. Next up we've got the Sniper Biker that is the Jackal Alphas. 60 points and can lead Atalan Jackals as you'd expect. Scout moves 9 and basically has a similar sort of profile to the Wolf Quad. 4 wounds and toughness 4. She's armed with the Colt Sniper Rifle, a precision weapon with strength 5, AP 2 and damage 3. A bit unreliable for actually taking out characters though occasionally you might get lucky. And even if you don't manage to inflict any damage, provided you actually hit the target with that Colt Sniper Rifle, you get to debuff the enemy unit. Everyone else shooting that target gets to reroll hit rolls of 1, so another way of stacking yet more damage against one key target, provided you can get that initial hit. Perhaps more importantly though, they allow the Jackals to move, shoot, move. So after the bearer's unit is shot, they get to move again. That does count as an extra normal move. So at least at the moment, unless Games Workshop does any errata or anything, you get to move again and trigger the Jackal's demolition charges once more. As mentioned, potentially for an 11 model unit, that's be 5 or 6 wounds the first time, and another 5 or 6 mortal wounds the second time. I'm genuinely not 100% sure if they intended that or not, but at the moment it's a pretty scary amount of demolitions. If you can get close enough to get that kind of damage combo off, it seems very good. I do feel like Jackals are going to be high up on the enemy's target priority list though, if they do rear their heads. Next up we've got the big muscle guy with the sledgehammer with the abominant. 75 points and can lead aberrants. Like his very slightly smaller brothers, he's got a big toughness 6. A 5 plus save, 5 wounds and the 4 plus feel no pain. And he contributes pretty hard to their melee as well with a sledgehammer, hitting on 3s with strength 12, AP minus 2, and a big damage D6 plus 1. He gives the damage output of the unit a big boost as well, giving them sustained hits 1. Really quite nice on a brutally scary unit already. And then if and when the unit does get wiped out, he's got the regenerating gene mass special rule, which means that the first time it's destroyed, on a 2+, plus, he gets back up at the end of the phase. Four wounds remaining, and that's quite nice in a model that's fairly tanky to take down, or ready to charge down another foe, and hopefully land another couple of those power sledgehammer attacks on them. For leading the aberrants, it's the choice between this guy or the biophagus, which we'll get onto. I think between his own melee and his combat buff, though, he's a perfectly reasonable choice, particularly as they do seem to be a squad that, if they're on the front lines, has at least a reasonable chance of being gunned down completely. Having him pop up as a nasty surprise afterwards does seem very nice indeed. Next up, for 55 points, we've got the Reductor Saboteur, a lone operative with the Infiltrators and Stealth special rules. A Mrs. Saboteur can make a lot of scary explosives happen, basically having four different ways to land bomb devices on the enemy, and they're all fairly powerful in their own way. First up, she's got some indirect explosives at 24 inch range, a few attacks at strength 5 and AP 0, not too bad for thinning down a few hordes that she might or might not be able to see. Very much not going to be wiping out entire squads, but can chip away with a little bit of damage turn on turn. She gets to use the grenade stratagem for 0 CP once per turn. Usually that's going to be an average of 3 mortal wounds on one target within range. 
Very nice general purpose damage there all around. She got a one use demo charge with the standard profile that's on the Acolytes, but instead of hitting it on a 5 plus, she gets to hit on a 2 plus instead, so it's massively more effective than any one Acolyte. And that's in addition for the potential for grenades and things. And then finally, as if that weren't enough, one of her best abilities is planted explosives. Once per battle, when an enemy unit ends a normal advance or fallback move within 12 inches of this model, you get to use its Reductus Mine. On a 2+, you get D3 plus 3 mortal wounds on your target. Again, that itself could go a long way to earning her points back just in one fell swoop, never mind any of the other explosives she has. It seems that they think that that one's so powerful that they limit it to just one Reductus Saboteur per turn, so you can't say have three of them next to an objective and hit the enemy with a spectacular amount of mortal wounds should they choose to move on to it. Overall, that's a whole ton of ways that this little model can earn back its points cost at 55 points, and having annoying lone operative characters on the board is pretty useful in its own right. I feel like perhaps one of her biggest weaknesses might be Overwatch. With just a toughness 3, a 5 plus save, and 3 wounds, it does mean that if she does get in range with her demo charge and things, there's at least a reasonable chance that enemy units might just turn around and kill her before she gets to strike. Overall, seems really quite helpful though. Maybe try and have her set up somewhere out of line of sight and in range of an objective, Use those reductive explosives, and then in your turn step forward to throw demo charges around, or use the grenade stratagem or both. Next up we've got the Sanctus for 50 points, again a lone operative with stealth and infiltrators, works pretty similarly to the Reductor Saboteur in that way. He gets the choice of either a Colt Sniper I4 with a similar profile to the Jackal Alphys' one, but it also gets an Anti-Psyker 3+, plus, or you can trade that out for the Sanctus Bio Dagger, 6 attacks at Strength 3, AP 2 and Damage 1, Anti-Infantry 3 plus with Precision, though even with those kind of stats I'm not sure it's all that impressive for a lone operative charging down an enemy unit. He gets to advance and charge, advance and shoot, and fall back and shoot and charge, though I think usually if he winds up in combat and the enemy's not dead, there's a good chance they're going to kill him with just 3 wounds. And at the start of the game he gets to declare his Psychic Spore, getting Ignore's cover and devastating wounds against one key unit that's going to be his prey. Perhaps most useful if he's got his sniper rifle and he gets to target an enemy psyker. Devastating wounds for three mortals on a 3 plus against them seems usable enough. Overall though, I feel like whichever way is used his damage output isn't going to be particularly spectacular for 50 points. I think if I was going for a disruptive lone operative, then the Reductor Saboteur would be my first choice over this guy. The last of the lone operatives is the Kelamorph for 55 points as well. He gets lone operative, but no stealth or infiltrate special rules. Instead, he's got an interesting special rule called Cometh the Hour, Cometh the Hero, where he basically gets to set up out of Deep Strike right next to a Gene Stiller Colt's battle line unit, and if he does so, he can set up within 3 inches of enemy units, as opposed to having to keep 9 inch horizontally back. Unfortunately, this time round, I feel like his Liberator Auto Stob pistols are a bit weird. They've both lost AP and damage, being 6 shots at Strength 5, AP 0, Damage 1. They do get sustained hits D3 and devastating wounds as well, so he is likely to chip away at characters, but anything with a quality armor save is not going to do all that much against. Feels like a unit where you're going to need quite a lot of rounds of shooting to make him justify himself unless you get very lucky. With that in mind, he does have a rule called Gunslinger, so he gets a reactive shooting attack, kind of similar to the Necron Hexmark Destroyer. Each time a Gene Stealer Colt battle line within 3 inches of him is shot, he gets to make a ranged attack of his own, blazing away with a bunch of strength 5 shots again, and he can target a unit of his choice, though only can shoot things up to 12 inch range, as that's how far his range is. I guess theoretically he could perhaps defend a block of neophytes, he could maybe have him lurking towards the front of them, somewhere where the enemy is almost certainly going to move a unit up and into range, and when they try and wipe them out with shooting, have him blaze away with the pistols every time a unit makes attack and against the squad. He does seem a bit fragile though, and if enemies do get within the lone operative range, he's going to die very fast with just three wounds. I suppose he could use that character stratagem to help bounce wounds onto nearby units, I guess. Overall, I think he's maybe not unusable, and does have some interesting disruption. Again, perhaps a little bit overshadowed by some of the raw power of some of the other units in the index, but might be a little bit more tempting to people if they went up in points. Next up we've got the Locus for 40 points, he again can join the Acolyte hybrids, the Metamorphs or the Neophytes, and like a few of the other elite support characters on this last bit of the list, he can join even if there's a Primus, Magus or Icon Ward already attached to the unit. I think for 40 points he remains a pretty interesting melee unit support character. He gets 5 attacks at Strength 5, AP-2 and Damage 2, pretty much ideally suited to taking down targets like Space Marines, and he gives his unit the fight's first special rule, so it means that if he was in a fighty block of Acolyte hybrids, if he charged them then you get to attack the enemy first, 
could be pretty big with their heavy mining weapons. It's also at least somewhat hard to take down with a 4 plus invulnerable save in its own right and gives other characters a 4 plus feel no pain type ability. So maybe does safeguard a unit that he had leading the squad. I think he looks worthy of consideration in a fighty acolyte squad with 10 men in it perhaps if you are using the rock tools over the demo charges. Next up we've got the Biophagus at 50 points and he's the other option for leading aberrants though he can also attach to the acolytes, metamorphs or the neophytes. Weapons wise he gets a little bit of low AP anti-infantry attacks, he can use his biological warfare ability once per battle where he gets extra attacks and extra damage. They are all at AP 0 though so if he's fighting things in power armour you might maybe kill one model and probably not more than that. Otherwise though he gives two rather powerful buffs to his unit, lethal hits for any unit that he's leading, really quite nice on any melee unit, I think that it helps round out the aberrants a bit as well means that their lethal hits will punch up against things like toughness 9 plus armour, where normally they would have been wounding on 5 pluses. On top of that, his acolyte familiar means that once per game your melee attacks can also get anti-infantry 2 plus, which is kind of big. That seems like it could be pretty massive on any of the units to be honest, most of the time they won't be wounding things on 2 pluses. Could even be pretty huge for the aberrants, say fighting against custodies or space marine terminators. Again, seems solid for the cost. I think he's another very reasonable choice to lead the aberrants, maybe give them the infiltration trait, as well as some big extra damage with lethal hits and the option for anti-infantry. Next up, we've got the Nexos, which seems to be a model that's very common in competitive lists right now. 50 points and can go in either Acolyte hybrids, Metamorphs or Neophytes again. As a man looking at a holographic board, he doesn't really do very much in terms of actual damage, and his value comes from two different buffs that he can take. A free stratagem for a unit, even if it's been already used elsewhere in your army. And then a special rule called Cult Infiltration. At the start of each player's command phase, if this model's on the battlefield, you can select one Cult Ambush marker and move it 6 inches. That could be useful to help keep certain units safe from the enemy and make sure they can't quite reach it with their units. Though hopefully you could already deploy them far enough back already I guess. Or alternatively if they don't quite have enough movement to get there you could move it a little bit further forward and perhaps get your unit in an optimal position to strike. Quite nice to have a little bit of flexibility and you can take a look at all your cult ambush tokens in each command phase and see if any of them could be positioned just a little bit better. The stratagem thing is really quite powerful I think, particularly with how good the gene stealer cult stratagems are. Could be useful to have in a neophyte block, maybe alongside a primus perhaps. Finally we've got the Clamavus, a cheap 40 point support character who generally seems to like hanging around on objectives. I'd say he's a bit more edge case for the Gene Stealer Colts, giving them a trio of minor boosts, a leadership 6 plus, a minus 1 to enemy battleshock within 12 inches, and if they happen to fail then failed tests cause immortal wounds. Might have been a little bit more helpful if there were more things to push out those battleshock tests other than patriarchs when they're in melee. I'd say perhaps the single most important thing, denying deep strike at 12 inches, which is quite a nice thing to have parked on objectives, as it could really limit the positions where your opponent could drop. Whether or not it's worth a 40 point character though, versus all the other good stuff that you can bring along is another question. I guess he could make a squad very hard to engage between that and maybe the prowling adjutant trait, allowing them to get a bit of movement plus deep strike denial. So anyway, there we have it for a roundup of Gene Stealer Cult units in the Index at the moment. Certainly a fantastically strong army when played to their full potential in Warhammer 40k right now. Massive threats from Acolytes and Neophytes that hit very hard and then respawn later to bring some more chaff infantry to the fight. Big hammer blows possible with things like the Aberrants deploying forward and the bikers dropping off some mortal wounds. Everything supported by some massively powerful stratagems that there's multiple ways to farm a little bit. And some very solid support characters as well. Maybe some of my favourites being the Primus, Nexus and maybe Reductus Saboteur. My guess is that Games Workshop will probably rein in some of their excesses a little bit in the next balance update, which honestly might not be the worst thing in the world for game balance of 40k overall. In tournaments and things, Gene Stealer Colts are pretty much ruling the roost alongside Eldari at the moment. I think they could lose a little bit of power and still be one of the top factions in the game. Hitting a couple of their very strong units might also mean that there's a little bit more play for some of the units that feel good but overshadowed. I feel like there's a fair few options in the index that fall into that camp. Maybe things like the Gene Stealers and the Metamorphs, which I think are unlikely to see play at the moment, but would genuinely be credible options if points were balanced differently. In any case, look forward to hearing your thoughts down in the comments. What's been working well so far for the Disciples of the Four-Armed Emperor for you? If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, or certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. And finally, if you have found the video useful, or want to support the creation of new videos like this in the future, 
I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.